Okay, family. This is Cassandra Faye Floyd, also known as the daughter of the fates. And I have a topic. It's a late night topic, but it was, it's been on me for a minute, actually. I've postponed this one for some time and uh, I couldn't put it off anymore. So as the title implies, we're going to be talking about sex today. And, you know, I am not a sex ed teacher, but I'll tell you, this is a discussion that I have been wanting to have for about two months, okay? And I debated about how to start, you know, how to start the question. Um, I debated about what direction I was going to go. I took some notes. I wanted some stats, you feel me? But it's really based on some personal experiences. So I have to preface the personal experiences before I get into, you know, the science of the thing. So I've been here in California now four years, going on four and a half years. And before I came to California, <clears throat> I had a really nice, fulfilling sex life. I did. And the reason why is because um, I demanded it. And what I mean by that is this, baby. Like a lot of girls in the South, like a lot of women in the South, at least, you know, when I was growing up, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a woman of age. I'm a woman of a certain age. You understand? I'm 47. <coughs> and I grew up in the Deep South. I grew up like many girls did in the Deep South. I grew up in the church. I grew up, you know, quote, a good girl. And, um, and <laughs> so growing up a good girl, you know, there wasn't a lot, there was never, there was never any time where I was talked to by adults of any kind about what I should be looking for transitioning into adulthood as, um, what I should be looking for in a healthy sex life, Right. Um, in fact, the only discussion that was ever had about sex was either your, uh, gym teacher sex edge class, which was, you know, terrifying. And then your, um, don't have sex until you get married, or you're going to kick the doors a hell wide open discussion by your Herald fire and brimstone preacher in your, um, in your, your church services. Right. And so, you know, <laughs> um, as I'm going to do a lot of sharing, right? <clears throat> so <clears throat> I, I guess I'll start back before I get to where I'm at. Um, so for me, like I had this split personalities disorder that I think a lot of people have and never really admit, never really face because sex has been made to be in this society, this extraordinarily unhealthy, duplicitous thing. On the one hand, it feels really good. We all want it. But on the other hand, whatever cultural, social, political, or religious beliefs we have make us tiptoe around the subject, make us uncomfortable with the truth of what we need to be sexually happy, right? And, um, and, forces us to, in a lot of ways, get thrills in unhealthy ways because sex itself has been so demonized, right? And so um, so for me, as a young girl, like heavily indoctrinated in the church, I'm like, I'm sharing with y'all because I've been telling y'all for, for a few weeks now, this is me purging, this is my Scorpio shadow shit, you feel me? So for me, um, I started masturbating very young. Um, I started masturbating, I would say, probably around 10 or 11 years old. And I'll tell you, this is the mind of a girl who never had discussions with anyone about sex. So when I would masturbate, I would, um, I would stop myself 
from climaxing. Like when I got to the point where I felt like I was about to quote, lose control or climax, I didn't notice as a girl child, but when I got to a certain point, I would stop. And in my mind, this is the psychosis of fucking religion, by the way. When I um, stopped myself from climaxing, in my mind, the act wasn't as bad if I didn't go all the way. This is me as a kid, as a child, having these urges that no one was acknowledging or talking me through or anything like that. These were the conclusions that I was coming through, that if I didn't have an orgasm, I didn't know what that was. I just know that I felt when there was a certain point that was coming and I would stop, I would pause, I would pump the brakes on my orgasm because in my mind, it wasn't as bad of a sin if I didn't go all the way. Okay. Now this neuroses that was happening in my mind happened all throughout high school. So when I lost my virginity, first of all, the, uh, you know, the man that I lost my virginity to is the father of my child. You feel me? And so when I lost my virginity and he was a few years older than I was, but when we started having sex, you know, I'm letting him lead. I don't know what I'm doing. Ain't nobody talked to me about what I'm doing. Right. And meanwhile, <laughs> I'm still watching shit on TV. And this is where my education is coming from. My education is coming from, you know, what was it? Um, oh my God, it used to be this late night HBO special that was like soft porn, right? So this is where my sex ed is coming from, right? So when he and I started having sex, you know, I'm a young black girl in the South. I'm just happy to be, get, I've always been a big woman, right? It's like, always, since I was 10. So I'm happy to be getting the attention. You understand what I'm saying? We were together about a year, maybe a year and a half. I'm happy to be getting the attention. You know, I think it's nice, like the kissing and the touching. It's nice, right? I never had sex with him. He never saw me naked, like fully naked. I always had a shirt on or slip on or something covering, you know, my upper parts. The first time he and I had sex, I went home and I cried. And I mean, full, I looking at myself in the mirror, full on wept. I wept because the first thing that I thought about after I had sex for the first time was that I was going to burn in hell. Like there was no way back from it. I was going to go to hell. But I kept going back to have sex with him. I had already done it. I might as well continue to do it. This is the fucking, this is the madness <laughs> imposed on human beings by this shit. So I'm, just walk with me. I'm getting someplace. So. I, you know, I end up getting pregnant and um, I don't have a sink. We never had sex with the lights on. We never had sex during the day. We never had sex with me fully undressed. Okay. And so in my mind, this was normal. I liked him. I wouldn't say that I loved him. I don't think I ever loved him, but, <clears throat> you know, it was a thing. It was it was what we did, right? So, but for a year and a half of regular sex with this man, I didn't have a single orgasm to show for it. Not one, not ever. Now, I did not know that because up until that point, I had still been halting my own orgasm when I would masturbate, right? So, it was maybe two and a half years after I had my daughter because my my ex and I, um, we parted ways when I got pregnant, when I decided to stay pregnant. And um, and so for two and a half years after I had my daughter, I did not have sex. So I had sex again. And um, and what I say is that I got turned out. You understand what I'm saying? Like this guy was a total exhibitionist. And um, he was like, no, all the lights on, take all that shit off. Like he was, a, he was, he would not remove his clothes. The first time we had sex together, he refused to take his clothes off until I came first. And that's how I got turned out. 
You understand what I'm saying? I was like, oh shit, this is what it's about. This is what I have. Uh, uh, this is what I've been missing out on all this time. Halting my own orgasm, not having an orgasm with my partner, not demanding it. And so after that, that was just my first like intercourse orgasm, right? And uh, then I had an experience. I won't get too graphic, but I had this experience with a man who happened to be a gynecologist. And so I am young. I'm like 23-ish, 20, I think I'm 23 or 24 when I met this man. And um, it was just a one night stand. I just went home with him for the night. And... um, that is when I discovered my ejaculate. That is when I discovered that I too could ejaculate, right? And um, so after that, and we did not have sex, we did not have intercourse that night at all. So I discover at the hands, literally, of a gynecologist, my, um, my ejaculate, right? that I could ejaculate and it was wonderful. And so I discovered these various types of orgasms that I could have. And so after that, baby, because there's a lot of women, a lot of women who say, I've heard them say, oh, you know, I can have good sex without an orgasm. It's a lie you tell yourself, baby. It's a lie you tell yourself. It's a lie you tell yourself because not not enough men show the fuck up to assist you in what you need to have an orgasm, not just an orgasm, but discover the various types of orgasms that one can have as a woman, right? So um, fast forward after that, um, I became very mouthy. Some would say I became a bitch because to me, my body was fucking magical. Like, wow, this amazing thing that happens to my body when somebody um, is interested enough to um, make sure I'm I'm good, right? And so from then on, baby, bad sex bad sex didn't happen for me. Didn't happen. Like I I say I became a bitch, but I didn't. I became I became audacious in what I needed just but just because first of all, I'm a giving lover, right? The whole act is this amazing, should be, this amazing reciprocal opportunity to to experience the ecstasy that the only other place that we can experience it is through illicit drugs, right? And I'm like, damn, we can do this without drugs, whatever, whatever, right? So once I discover my orgasms, baby, and I have at least that I've discovered. Now I've heard women say more than this. I'm I'm still trying to figure it out, but I have discovered for myself five different orgasms that I have, okay? Now, where am I going? So for years, baby, I've been single. So first of all, I'm a Virgo. I'm I'm a dirtle earth sign. I'm a Virgo sun, a Capricorn moon, and a Gemini rising. So Virgos are notoriously picky in partnership. They don't, they don't partner easily, but when they do, they're all in, right? And so whenever I would experience a breakup, like I needed some time. I wouldn't just jump. I don't rebound. I don't just jump into the next relationship. As a matter of fact, <laughs> you know, I like, I go, I, I'm the opposite, right? Like, you know, and so um, there have been long periods of time in my life um, where I was single after a breakup, long periods. I've been single now six years, right? And so uh, I get to California. I love this. So let me just say, I have not had bad sex. Um, I had not had bad sex the entire time I lived in the state of Florida. Not at all. Not one time I can recall having an attitude with someone that I had had sex with. Not once. 
right? I get to California, this state that I love, in LA, this city that I love so, so much. I love this place so much. And even when I'm down, baby, I am happy. I, I love where I live. I do. And I <clears throat> know that California, Los Angeles in particular, has its flaws, many of them. But for me, I knew instantly I was supposed to live here, right? The one major consistent complaint that I have about this goddamn city, <laughs> this state, is that I have been here four years and my sexual encounters child have had me in a constant state of rage. Ha and not just that, to hear as many women as I know socially or personally who have grown accustomed, who live here, have always lived here and have grown accustomed to expecting sex with a partner to be lousy. They have grown accustomed to the culture of lousy lovers in this city. How women have not burnt this bitch to the ground is beyond me because I stay in my goddamn feelings about my sex life in this city. So when I got, I'm really sharing with y'all right now. I'm being real extra transparent right now. You feel me? So when I got to the city, so you sh most people know, you know, for those that don't, the time that I was in Florida, the majority of the time that I was in Florida, um, I was in uh, an organization that was for all, you know, a black nationalist organization. So for the duration of that time, 12 to 15 years, 15 years that I was in Florida, I didn't have sex with anyone who wasn't African, who wasn't black, right? Like I love black men. I love seeing me and my partner, right? No biggie. I love black men. And, um, and so cool. So when I come to California and one in LA, like the, the racial demographic here is really interesting. It's, really interesting. Like when I got here, I was like, where are all the black people at? Like this ain't the LA I grew up seeing on TV. Where, where we at? Where are, you got to go looking for black folks. You got to go to the places where black folks, like LA, Hollywood. I can go a whole day in my neighborhood and never see a brother, never see a sister. Right. So you got to go looking for us in the city, which is another, another discussion for another day. But when I got here, not only do you have to go looking for Africans, baby. When I got here for the first time in a very, very long time, I was feeling really insecure about my swag, baby. Like about my like about my whole swag. You feel me? Like brothers weren't just baby, let me tell you something. When you did when I did see a brother when I got here, and I would because I'm from the South, so I speak to everybody that passes through my cipher. Hey, how you doing? Keep it moving. Baby, <laughs> I would I would outwardly laugh. It happened so often where I would speak to a brother and they not only would actively ignore me, but put their eyes on the ground to e avoid eye contact. And I'd be like, yo, it ain't that deep. I'm just speaking. It's <laughs> still like, yo, it, I'm not trying to make a baby with you, boo. I'm just, I'm just speaking. You feel me? It was deep. So I was like, okay, my conclusion was I'm a big girl from the South and I'm in Hollywood. I'm in California. Everybody likes so, you know, fit and physically, you know, hyper-physically conscious or whatever. So I was like, maybe that's it. Like they don't, they don't rock with big girls out here like that. Cool. But baby, that ain't it. Because I didn't miss women, young women, 22, 30, beautiful, flawless, 
flawless skin, flawless hair, Coke bottle figure, beautiful black women who say the same thing. That brother, the quote that I've heard numerous times out here is brothers don't be jocking for sisters like that out here. Brothers don't be jocking for sisters out here like that. You can't, you can't even imagine how many times I've heard that. Shit. Brothers don't be jocking for sisters like that out here. They want something exotic or they want a white girl. That's what I hear all the time. So I was like, I ain't going to be in my feelings about it, right? But some time went by. A lot of time went by. And I had not had sex. I'm like, this is problematic. This is a problem. Okay? Now, so I met this girl, a sister. Beautiful sister. Oh, my God. Professional dancer, globe trotter, published author, beautiful black woman, right? Fair skin, just beautiful. She said, baby, look, <laughs> she said, when I moved out here from Baltimore, she said, I stayed in my field. I couldn't get a brother to buy me no drink at the bar. She's like, damn, am I, am I cute as I think I am? Like, these women really be out here, like, self-questioning because of the culture out here, right? She said, baby, look, she said, if you expect to get laid, if you expect to have a good time out here, you don't have to get on one of these dating apps. She said, I had to do it. She said, and I feel like I'm a dime and I had to do it. I was like, that ain't no shit. I'm interested. I never before moving to California been on a dating app. Not ever. Never considered it. Never crossed my mind. Why would it? Every time I went out, if I went out with the intention of having a one night stand, it was done. It was done. You understand? Not here. If I went out with the attention, you know what I'm saying, of getting close to a brother, I have a pick, baby. Not here, right? So she was like, baby, look, I'm just trying to tell you, I've been out here a year and a half. She, I'd only been here a few months. She said, I've been out here a year and a half, and I finally had to bite, I had to bite the bullet. I had to get on one of these dating apps. She found her husband on her dating app, but she, I think she did like plenty of fish or tender or something like that, but she found a husband. I was like, oh my God, I don't want to do this, but I did it. I got on Tinder. This is maybe five months after I got here, <clears throat> got on Tinder and um, I had fun. It, you know, it was fun. I wasn't on it long, but it was fun, you know, for what it was. I mean, I probably have to do a whole live People keep telling me I just need to write a book just on my Tinder experiences because that shit was crazy. <laughs> that shit was crazy. Like, oh my God, only me. Like, I can't imagine that shit happens to anybody. I had the craziest stories, man. But anyway, so, um, you know, and then I would decide, you, you know, guys would take me out and, you know, I would decide at the end of the night, am I going to fuck this guy or am I not? Right? Baby, look. The first dude, because I'm still, you know, not, I'm still like only interested in brothers, right? So I go on Tinder and, you know, I match with this dude, this brother. And he was, he seemed charming. Like we went out for drinks. We had a good time. And, um, oh my God, you can't make it make sense. You, to me... So maybe it's my age, but you can't make you can't make an excuse and you cannot make bad sex make sense. I do not fucking care. You cannot make bad sex make sense. OK, you can't. Especially not with someone like me that will tell you what I need. Not in a, not in an overbearing way, just like I will tell you what I need. Right. You will know when I am done. OK. And so, and I often say, my motto is, is that if I have not come, you have not tried. Like, that's how easy it is for me. That's how easy, child, look, I'm multi-orgasmic. I told you, I, you know, I ejaculate. And so when, like, I am, I am as easy as men can be. I can have my first orgasm in the first five Two minutes doesn't mean I'm done, first of all. Second of all, it just means that I am 
extremely in tune with me. I, I am completely aligned and in tune with me and my needs. And that's why I am a giving lover because I, listen, I enjoy sex, like deeply, profoundly, full body, full sensory enjoy sex. It's not a hobby. It's not some shit that I do to, to get the stress off. I recognize the power of the, of the act and I am fully engaged and fully embodied in it, baby. I love it. I love it all. I love it sexy. I love it dirty. I love it nasty. I love it gentle. All of that. So I don't have a problem telling my partner, baby, this is what I need. Right? Baby, look. To come out here, first of all, I was so distressed, baby, because like, I love us. You understand? I love Black men just to look at. <laughs> you understand? Just, they are the perfect products of their mother's magic. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Black men are the perfect products of their mother's magic. I'll give you, I'll give your mama your props for your power boy. So anyway, they're beautiful beautiful. Their swag is crazy. And the swag differs from place to place. And I appreciate all of it. I love Northeast brothers. I love Southern men, right? I love the, I love, there's a, there's a certain swag here in California that I appreciate. But baby, when I tell you, I am admitting some deep shit for y'all right now. You understand? When I tell you, that of the black men that I have had sex with since I have been in this city, I have not had good sex with a black man since I have been in this goddamn city. Not one. Not one. And it's so frustrating. It's so I look I look so forward to being in the embrace of a black man, to be totally disappointed. So now let me tell you the other paradox here, you understand? So as I've gotten older and as I've gotten more spiritual, you know, I've been doing a lot of work in my, you know, later years um, to soften, you understand? To be more, um, to be softer. <laughs> right to um child to not yeah yeah and, and so another part of that is like being in the organization that I was in and having to politically spar with men all the time right like I had to be as sharp politically so I could spar with men, black men, politically, because they always want to try your intelligence and shit. You a woman, so you can't be as articulate as them. You can't know the line and articulate the line with the same confidence as them. So I was always having to, you know, sh sharpen iron with men, right, in the organization. And so I think that a lot of that spilled over into my relationships with men that I was having sex with. Right. Where I've had men tell me <laughs> I've had men tell me I'm mean. Right. I'm talking about sexually. I'm mean. Or um, I had several dudes say, damn, yo, you act, you act like a nigga. You like you act like a brother. I was like, well, and my response was always the same. Well, it should give you some inclination about how you motherfuckers treat women. And if you don't like it, then you go treat women better. You go treat women sexually better. Right. That should have like, I have stories, baby. I have stories about how I had to like, I had to make good lovers out of men. Some men <laughs> that I had sex with. You understand? Um, because they were not accustomed to women telling them what the fuck they need. So I remember I had I was maybe in my 30s and I was I met this guy. He was younger than me. Maybe, I think he's maybe, I think he is six years younger than I am. Whatever. I was in my thirties. He was in his twenties and um, good looking African God, man, just 
we're really good friends now. We're still really good friends, right? Um, oh, he was so good looking. So we had sex the first time and it was quick, unenthusiastically quick. But I was like, you know what? It's, you know, it's strange. We call it strange in the South, right? When you have a one night stand or you have sex with somebody for the first time, it's strange. So it's supposed to be exciting. You understand what I'm saying? But however, it's new. It's exciting. It's a little risque. So, you know, some, some men may get a little overly excited, whatever. So I was like, all right, I'm going to give you a pass. But I only give one pass. So... It was quick. I was like, fine, whatever. He called me about a week later. I was asleep. I was going to call me. It was two o'clock in the morning. It was after the club. I knew it was a booty call. I was down for it. You feel me? So uh, he calls me. He, I was like, yeah. He was like, can I come through? I was like, yeah, I could get late. So he comes through, wakes me up to come through, comes into my house and attempts to do the same thing to just Pound on me for a few minutes and gone about his life. Child, look, <laughs> baby. He got dressed. He got dressed. I didn't say a word. He was like, you all right? I was like, I'm great. I'm good. Um, I said, I'm good. You understand? I watched him get dressed. I walked him to my door. I was crazy calm. I said, now what I need you to do is I need you to delete my phone number out your phone and I need you to forget where the fuck I live. He was like, what, what, what's the matter? Why are you mad? I said, I'm not mad. I said, I just don't appreciate people coming over here. You coming over here, wasting my sexual energy. It's cool. I was like, it won't happen again. And I slammed the door in his face. So this guy who I just pumped, baby, I just slammed the door in your face, told you, you wasn't shit in bed. And told your ass, don't call me and forget where the fuck I live. How about he blew my phone up every day for weeks, for weeks. And so after a couple of weeks, I answered the phone. I was like, "You, it, it is your lucky day um, because I'm in the mood to get late. I said, but what's going to happen is I'm going to let you come over and you're going to do what I say. And that's how that's going to happen. So if, you, if you're not down with that, that's cool, right? I was like, but if you come over here tonight, it's what the fuck I say. So he comes over. My my channel is never going to get monetized. I swear. He comes over and, um, and I take him to my room and I start to undress. And he starts taking off his clothes. I said, oh, no, 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 no. You're not getting undressed. He is, I said, as a matter of fact, don't even take off your shoes. You're not getting undressed. He's like, what you mean? I said, just what I said is just what I, I said. You can leave if you want to. I said, but it's what I said. If you expect that we are going to have sex again, is what the fuck I say right now. So I got undressed and turned on all the lights. And I, can I say this online? I don't think I can. But I let him perform fellatio on me until I came. And when I came, I almost put his eye out, whoosh, sharp, whoosh, straight across. He was like, oh, my God, I've never seen anything like that in my whole life. I thought that shit was fake. I thought that shit was only on porns. I thought it was a trick. He was like, that's the most amazing shit I've ever seen. I said, so let me just tell you something right now. So he didn't get no pussy that night. He didn't get laid last night. I made him perform fellatio on me, fellatio on me until I was done. I came about 10, maybe 12 times that night. But it was until I was done. And then he got up and cleaned himself off and went his ass home. And from that day for we had great sex every time after that. So much so that he refused to fuck me until I came first. But I had to challenge him because I told him, I was like, baby, look, I'm not one of these young girls that's your age that don't know how to ask or don't know how to tell or don't, don't know how to make you come through, right? So you ain't going to, I'm not going to be your jump off. You understand what I'm saying? So we had great sex for so many years. Such a wonderful, grown up, 
sexual relationship with someone that I actually care about. We friends never been in a relationship. I know his babies. I know his mama. You understand what I'm saying? Great grown up, uncomplicated sexual relationship. But I had to make that motherfucker a good lover. And so fast forward to here, because I can tell so many stories like that where I have to I have to be an ass. And so I'm wondering, and that's probably part of what I'm going to get into. Cause here, baby, I'm like, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't become, I didn't become Zen out this joint. You feel me? I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a doctor and I'm a healer and I'm a, I'm a minister. I'm a spiritual worker. You understand? I'm doing all this constant work on myself to become my best self. And I am like, I am going to have to be that old person if I'm going to get laid appropriately out here. So the other thing that had to happen was I had to, I had to broaden my horizons. I used to hate to hear people say that shit, but I had to broaden my horizons if I expected that I was going to have anything that resembled a fulfilling sex life out here. So I, um, and, and really the only men that were really jocking for me like that out here, like really, you know, being suave or throwing swag or whatever to try to get my attention were um, native men, were South American men, like Mexican and South American men and um, and white guys. Now, I haven't had sex with any white men since I've been out here, but I've had sex with others because brothers have refused to show the fuck up. I do not understand it. That does not mean that I have not had bad sexual experiences with others too, because I have. But there, um, you know, there was one person that I met that I stayed with for far too long just because the sex was explosive and I, it was a sure thing, right? But I'm like, damn, I sh at this age, I should not have, to, first of all, to be having sex with men who swear they're progressive and the sex is lousy, I don't believe you. Because to me, sex isn't just sex. And it took me a long time to understand this. Sex isn't just sex. So here I was in my own mind, compartmentalizing my own life and my own experiences. And somehow sex was outside these other things, my spirituality and my political ideology and, you know, and all of this stuff. And somehow sex was outside this, this other part of myself. And so I wasn't even able to articulate or make sense to why I was having these kind of experiences with men, not just men, not just laymen, men who claim to be progressive. Men who claim they want to change the world. You understand what I'm saying? Men who claim to be revolutionaries. <laughs> like men who, who claim to give a damn about the people, who, who claim to give a damn about the future and shit. How can you? And I have heard so many young women in political circles who are like revolutionaries or who are activists out here with the same frustration. I just knew that if I had a man, a partner, a lover who believed the same things that I did, that the sex could only be good. Why would a woman come to that conclusion? Because sex is political. How you show up for a lover, even if it's a one night stand, is a, is a statement about that person's value, how you value or not value the person that you're having sex with. It's a political statement, baby. And I was acting brand new. Here I was compartmentalizing my sexual experiences, my sexual frustrations over here, apart from what I <laughs> have called the core of myself, as if my sexual satisfaction is not a core part of my lived experience on this planet. And so I'm sitting here having this epiphany. I'm talking to my homeboy on the phone about it because I talked to him about everything. I'm like, I just had a goddamn breakthrough, motherfucker. Like misogyny. I'm talking all the time for you, those of you who are tuning in, some of you sit with me on Saturdays, like tomorrow for hours while we go through this book, The Great Cosmic Mother. We sitting here and learning this shit in real time that the assault 
on the sexual autonomy of the female body is the origin of patriarchy. Not a side note or a, a side effect of, of patriarchy. The sexual autonomy of the female body was the first assault made in the establishment of the patriarchy. So why at this day and age would I be acting brand new about why I am having such a unbelievably terrible sexual experience out here? And it is because even though men swear They are progressive. The malignancy of patriarchy just oozes in so many ways from their behavior. It does. And to treat a woman, any woman, I don't give a goddamn who she is, even if she is a prostitute and you are paying, motherfucker, to treat a woman like a fucking glorified blow-up doll during sex is the height. It is the it is one of the most glaring uh, examples of your hatred of women, of your disdain for women, for you as a grown-up child. As a grunt, we ain't talking about prepubescent kids who don't know how to have sex yet. We aren't talking about teenagers who, who don't have no experience. We're talking about grown goddamn men. For you to be a grown up, to be an adult, and to not, it blows my mind. You can't make it make sense. You can't make it make sense how, um, yeah, you are okay energetically with leaving a woman obviously frustrated in an encounter with you. That shit is gross. <laughs> it's, it's malignant as fuck. You need therapy is what you need. That shit is wild to me. Because every time, like the example that I gave you earlier, yeah, that, that first two times when he treated me like a jump off, yeah, he could have got his little nut and gone on about his life. But when I made him show the fuck up like a grown goddamn man in his sexual encounter with me, chop, he, his whole disposition changed. His whole disposition changed. I have a loving friendship relationship with this man to this day, 15, 18 years later. Shit, more than that. <laughs> more than that. Many years later, it changed his whole disposition. But why should a woman have to clown your ass before you feel inclined to show up? It is because you are still experiencing internalized patriarchy, internalized misogyny. You hate women. It don't mean you don't love fucking women. It just means you hate women as people. There's a difference. You hate women as people. Because I, I know a whole host, hundreds of thousands of millions of black men, white men, red men, yellow men, brown men, who swear they love, quote, they women. But their women are sexually frustrated. Why? Size has nothing to do with it. I have had sex out here with men. So first of all, and this is gonna be <laughs> this is gonna probably gonna get me in trouble. But I've never had sex with an ugly man. Not ever. Not ever. I love beautiful men. I love beautiful men, and beautiful men love fucking me. You understand? So I've never had sex with what I would say is an unattractive man, an ugly man. So, man, I met this brother out here who talked cash shit, yo. So fine. Oh, child. So fine. You understand? 
rocking his fucking amethyst ring, these dope ass tattoos of like, you know, like I got my dinkra. He's got his dinkras and shit. I'm like, oh my God, dreadlocks, just oh Jesus. Oh my God, he was so fine. So fine. You understand? A DJ. Oh my God. So talented. So like, yo, a dancer. Like, oh my God, just speaking to my whole spirit. You understand? Oh my God. And I was so excited the night I brought him home. I could not wait. We couldn't get here fast enough. You feel me? We couldn't get here fast enough. I was so hyped. When he took his shirt off, I'm just like, ugh, let me just hold up. Let me just look at you for a minute, baby. Oh my God. Grown ass man. My age grown. My age grown. You understand? Fine. Oh, child. Beautiful. He had the perfect body. He had a big dick. And I am not exaggerating. When I say that he was the absolute bar none lousiest lay I ever experienced in my whole goddamn existence. It, I was stunned. I was literally, I was literally stunned. I'm, I'm like, literally. I was like, I said, I was like, yo, are you done? He was like, oh, that was amazing. <gasps> Child, you can't make this shit up. I was like, oh my God. Oh my God. I was so beside myself, child. I was stunned. Now the old me would have just cussed his ass out and told him to get the fuck out of my house. That's how bad I used to be. Like, I'd be like, mm-mm. Mm-mm. This will not fly, sir. This will not fucking do. You got to go. You got to get the fuck out my shit right now. Go. You got to go. So now I'm all, you know, I'm straddling the fence of becoming an elder and shit. So I got to have a certain level of decorum I'm, some, I'm imagining or some shit. You know, I did all this spiritual work. So I have to have this level of calm, right? And decorum and shit. To have someone come and invade my space, man. Invade the sanctity of my goddamn house to do, to do that? Oh, child. And then had the nerve to text me the next day talking about when can I, when can we make magic again? Oh, child, I texted him back. I said, never. I said, never. And blocked his ass. I didn't even have, child, I didn't even have, I ain't even have the energy to cuss his ass out good. I ain't even have the energy to cuss his ass out. You understand? What in the, how in the hell do you become a 47 year old man pulling that bullshit? And thinking you did some shit. And thinking you did some shit. Child, he going to send me a text talking about when can we make magic again? Child, I felt disrespected. I felt fucking violated is what I felt. That shit was shameful. Shameful. And it does not matter. You understand? Like, anyway. So that's my personal experience. That's why I got an attitude. You feel me? Like, that's why I have an attitude. Because my me in Florida, this would not, this would be a non-discussion. In Atlanta, this would be a non-issue. A non-discussion. A non-discussion. You understand? But here, I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is about the culture here. If it's everybody's too Hollywood or I don't know what it is, baby. But it's not for lack of encounters. 
the encounters are shabby. So it's gotten to the point, this dude, this good looking African, oh my God, came on to me three nights ago, I went out. Good looking African, oh my God, so cute, so dark, so fine. But child, he was like, the, the you know, the music was over and we're talking and, and he's like, um, he's like, so what you getting into? I was like, I'm about to get into my bed. He was like, oh, well, can I get in it with you? I said, absolutely not, sir. Absolutely not. He was like, well, we grown folks, ain't we? I said, yes, we are. And this grown up is going home by herself, right? Now, let me just tell you, I don't have a problem with one night stands. I don't, not at all. I don't feel no kind of way about them at all. Like I said, between my heartbreaks, I take long, long periods away from relationships, but I still get fed sexually. That's what I do. You understand? And so I don't have a problem with one night stand. And the old me, I don't even say the old me, child. I'll just say that me that's been here since I've been in California. It's like, mm -mm. <laughs> I don't do one night stands out here. Because I'm telling you 75%, I'm not saying 50%, I'm telling you 75% of the time you can bank on someone being a horrible excuse for a lover. I don't get it. I, you can't make me understand it. There is no scenario that you can tell me that can justify. And then I know it's not just me. I've heard too, 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 too many women talk about their sexual frustration, accepting that the majority of the time they're having sex, they're not going to have an orgasm. That is outrageous. Out, I cannot even fathom it. It's outrageous. So now let me get into the numbers and shit, right? So I've been crunching numbers, looking at all kinds of stats and stuff. And I found this, um, oh, I should have wrote the name of the place down. But anyway, I'm going to put it in the, um, in the links. I'm going to put a link in the description below, okay? Um, about the countries that have the best sex and the countries that have the worst sex stats on um, the, I didn't even know this was a thing until I was preparing for this, the orgasm gap. Right. And how they measure the orgasm gap from country to country. Right. And uh, what countries have the best lovers? What countries um, do the men take more time in their sexual encounters than others? Right. Baby, the sex gap globally. The sex gap globally is 48 um, percent only half of the global population that is sex, you know, that's, a, you know, of legitimate age to have sex and stuff. Half, less than half, 48%, only 48% of people, um, you know, surveyed said that they always or almost always have orgasm during sex. 48%, half the world of people having sex aren't having orgasms. That's a problem. Of that 48% of people who said they always or almost always have sex, 61% of those were men and 33% of those were women. So that's a further gap, right? The um, And so by country, um, and then the way that they determined the orgasm gap was percentage of male to female orgasms. How many men say that they always or almost always have se uh, have an orgasm during sex? And how many women always or almost always have an orgasm during sex? And what is the difference in those percentages, right? In America, baby, only 41% of the women surveyed said that they always or almost always have um, experienced orgasm during, during sex. 41%. 41%. America ranked the fifth worst country for sex, sexual gratification. The fifth worst country surveyed on earth. The fifth worst for sexual gratification. You understand? <laughs> so 
And I, there were tons and tons and tons of more st statistics. But, you know, and then one more thing I'm going to mention within the context of this. I read this article. I'll also see if I can find it again and put it in the links, put a link in the description below. This article about um, sexual um, sexual liberty in Iceland, right? <laughs> and um, the article was talking about why the why the culture looks the way that it does. Like um, Iceland has the most is they say that Iceland is the most gender equal um, society on earth. The most gender equal country on earth is Iceland. Um, there are almost um, almost completely equal um, male and female representation in all areas of the government, right? Whatever, whatever. So what they were accrediting um, Iceland's um, gender equality to was the history of um, Iceland's sexual experiences. Now, rock with me. What they were saying was, was I think it was after... I want to say it was after the Second World War. I have to find the article, but anyway, it was after one of these wars. There was some, there was some something. Something happened. It was some cataclysm. I forget what it was. Some something. Some something that happened. I gotta find this article. I'm, but that's not the issue. Some something happened, and it wiped out a huge percentage of the population. It was devastating to the population and um, they didn't know how they were going to, it was, was it a plague? It was some natural something that happened and it wiped out a significant percentage of the population. It was a crisis, you know, diminishing of the population. And so what the government did was to um, create sex laws that were incentivized. So these sex laws were basically um, to encourage women to have children. The government would pay for women to have up to six children and they did not have to be married to have children, to, have, to, to receive the incentive for these children. Um, as a matter of fact, sex went from being a taboo in Iceland to women participating in this process of repopulating the goddamn country. Women were seen and treated as national patriots. And so the sexual taboos were eliminated out of necessity, like. Um, one night stands were no longer frowned upon or discouraged, but they were actually encouraged. Women were not forced or, you know, made to feel like they had to have sex, um, have to ha have to be married in order to have a family where they could thrive and take care of that family. The country incentivized financially women having children so that they didn't have to rely on being in loveless marriages or abusive marriages or whatever to have children, right? All of the um, taboos around sex were basically eradicated. So now in Iceland, <laughs> it's amazing. In Iceland, they um, the culture is to totally flipped. So like us, you know, we say we don't have sex with a guy that we're genuinely interested in for so many dates. He has to woo us for so long before we can have sex with him. Otherwise, he won't respect you and all of this stuff. Like that's the culture here, right? And if you want to, quote, snag a husband, you can't have sex too soon, all this shit. Well, in Iceland, it's totally opposite. In Iceland, the culture is like defined by one night stands. What the people say is, is that you don't even, if you meet somebody at the bar or at a club or out or whatever, and they're, you know, they're attractive and you're attractive or whatever, and then you guys go have sex. You don't even ask each other, <laughs> each other's names. You go have sex, right? And if you have good, if you have good sexual chemistry, 
then from there, you can determine if this is something that you want to pursue, if you want to know more about this person. But they said, they were like, we don't date before we have sex. We have sex before we date. Because if we have sex and the sex is terrible and we're not interested, then we haven't wasted, <laughs> we haven't invested or wasted any time wooing someone that we're not sexually compatible with. Right. And so here in the 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 country that has the most gender equality, there is no wage gap between men and women. Women hold as much as many seats in public office as men. And what they attribute this gender equality to in the society, baby, is the sexual autonomy of women. The destruction of sexual taboos that profoundly impacted women and not men. So when I tell you that sex is a, is, is a political question, that failure to show up for a partner who may even be a stranger is a political statement. It is a statement about how you perceive the value of the person that you are making contact with. So you've already developed some preconceived notions about this person's value or valuelessness, because the other aspect of that is there's several articles that I've read over the years authored by black women who've written articles with headlines such as 10 things black women can't do. Um, black women can't do on a first date that white women can do. Right. Because we you have all developed you know, um, you've already developed in your mind um, these ideas based on our acculturation in this country about a person's value or valuelessness, right? And so for why would a black woman, any black woman feel the need to write an article talking about 10 things black women can't do on a first date that a white woman can and a white woman can still get married, but a black woman can't. Right. A, a black woman who does these things is not marriage material, but a white woman who does these things can still get married. You feel me? That is about a judgment that you have passed about me and my value as a black woman, as being black and female. Right. How you show up sexually for your partner. You can't tell me from this day forward. Nobody might even see this. It might be just three people I'm talking to. But you can't tell me ever again in life that you give a damn about people, you give a damn about women, you give a damn about the future of humanity, you give a damn at all. If you are not taking the time when you are in a sexual interaction with another human being and you do not show the fuck up for them, I don't believe you. I don't believe you're a revolutionary. I'm just telling you what it is. I'm just telling you what it is. Hey, sis, how you doing? I'm just telling you what it is. You can't make me believe it. I don't want to hear it. That's the starting point. And I'm sitting here giving you the political history. If I'm telling you that the first assault made that gave birth to concretized patriarchy is the assault on female sexual autonomy then why would it be hard for you to believe it here? 6,000 goddamn years later, you men showing up lousily in your sexual encounters with women is not a direct response to your hatred of women. Doesn't matter that you enjoy women's bodies or that you like or you like seeing a big ass or big titties. That's not the point. Doesn't matter that you may like fucking on women. You still hate women. And that's a political statement. How you refuse to show up for women sexually is a political statement that if she, quote, a whore, then she don't deserve to uh, to be sexually cared for. Right. Or if she's a prude, there are certain things you won't or are unwilling to do with your prudish wife that you're willing to do with the prostitute. All of these things are the examples of your hatred of women. It is. It is. And to have statistics like only a third of the women who are sexually active in this country have orgasms, that's a problem. And y'all ought to be ashamed of your goddamn self. You ought to be ashamed of yourself <laughs> if you are having sex with women. You understand what I'm saying? You ought to be ashamed of yourself. 
if I was a man living in the country where somebody could say that only a third of the women having sex in this motherfucker are having orgasms, I would take the shit personal. I would take the shit personal. It ain't me and mine. I show up for my partners. You understand? And then um, I wanted to, but it's already an hour, so I'm going to shut up. But that's what I had to say. I had a whole attitude. I've had an attitude for some time because the last person that I had sex with, which was in the beginning of August, I think. For me to even have to think about the last time I had sex is problematic for me. You feel me? It's a problem. But anyway, the last time I had sex was about three months ago, three and a half months ago, whatever. And it was the, the DJ, the fine, beautiful, grown ass, my age, dancing DJ who talked cash shit. <sighs> All these promises, man. Oh, my God. And the other thing is, is like, like, I enjoy sex so much. Like, I really do. I enjoy every, I'm an exhibitionist, child. I love public sex. I, I love to be seen. I love to watch. You understand? Like, I don't have any, I don't have any issues with sex. And it's beautiful myriad of ways that it can be done. I don't. None. No, 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 no. Because I enjoy my body. I enjoy my body. I enjoy how my body feels when someone else is enjoying my body. I love, you know, I have a saying that there's nothing that makes a motherfucker feel sexier than sexy sex. Like all of it, the shit talking, all the things, all the things. I'm going to tell you one more thing that happened, then I'm going to let y'all go. So I've been in my feelings for some time now about my, fix, my sexual frustration, right? And, and so today, no, it was yesterday. It was just really, it's a combination of things. One, I'm lonely. My grandbabies done left. My family done left. I'm here by myself. I'm lonely, right? I'm heartbroken, really. I miss my family, right? So that's one thing. But it would not be as, and, I, and this is a moment I guess I'm having to walk by myself, but it still does not weaken my frustration, right? So I'm, on the one hand, I'm lonely and I'm sad because my family is gone. And this period, this transitional period since they've been gone has been a lot deeper than I thought, it, than I really internalized it would be. But I'm very sad most of the time these days for the last couple of months. And so, but if I had a sexual partner that I could regularly, you like, like, okay, so my grandbabies was here. So I was getting kisses and hugs all day, every day. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Now I'm like completely skin starved, right? Like I'm not holding hands with anybody. I'm not getting hugs from anybody and I'm not having sex regularly, right? So the last time I have sex was with this guy child that promised the world. And when I say I have been in my feelings about this encounter ever since, like typically I could just say some shit off and just act like the motherfucker never existed really. Right. But it's not been that because it's so much more. It's so much more than just, you know, quote, having a lousy lover. It's so much more. And so now I have to like, I'm like, okay, well, am I going to have to just like stop having sex? You know what I'm saying? Like the guy that came on to me a couple of nights ago, any other time, if I had any kind of confidence that the motherfucker was going to show up, right. I would have taken him home. It had been a non-issue, but being in California and knowing that one, that three out of every four people are going to be lousy. 75% of the people that you come into contact with are going to be lousy lays. That ain't no, th those aren't some stats I'm willing to try not anymore. So I'm like, okay, I guess I'm going home by myself. Every time I go out, I'm going home by myself because this. So I get a call yesterday from a friend in Italy, a guy I dated very shortly. One of my, 
my tender moments. Um, he was only here for a little while and we played while he was here and he was fantastic, right? Because he was not from here. That's the only conclusion I can come to because he was young. He's younger than I am. I think he's 10 years younger than I am. Yeah, 10 years younger than I am. He's in his mid thirties maybe, right? But he was smart. He was charming. He was funny. He was so open. Like we did so many things, so much fun shit, right? He was just open to whatever. He was down for whatever. And we talk every two, three months, check in or whatever. But even though he's in Italy, it was so refreshing. Oh my God. I just forgot. I forgot. God damn it. What it feels like to be desired. Because the whole time he was here, he never played any games. Never. If he didn't want to hang out, he would just say, uh, I'm not really, I don't really want to hang out today. Let's try in a couple of days. And then he would call me in a couple of days. No game playing, no bullshit. You understand what I'm saying? Just grown man shit, right? And so even when he calls to check in, yeah, it'll be, you know, sweet at first. It's like, yeah, you know, when are you coming to visit and this, that, and the other? And how are you doing? And how's the family? Chit chat, whatever, whatever. And then, you know, it is purely sexy because I believe him. One, I believe he, there ain't shit he can get. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, we're on the phone from far, far away. We haven't seen each other since before pandemic, right? And so two and a half years, we haven't seen each other face to face. But when we talk, it's total, he's totally sexy. Oh my God. Just and believable. You understand? Not like you tell a bitch some shit because you're trying to get in the draws to jump off real quick with some bullshit. You feel me? Like, you know, he's 3,000 miles away and, you know, he's tell he's telling me, send, you know, send me, uh, send me voice messages. I want to have your voice recorded. Your voice turns me on. I forgot how fucking sexy you are. Look at your eyes, Yapo. Oh my God. Yeah. Like, I am sitting in this fucking city surrounded by people and I forgot what it feels like to be desired. <laughs> what it, not, I'm talking about desired. You understand? There's a difference. You know, like when a motherfucker is just looking to get laid and is willing to lay anybody that he comes into contact with because it's the end of the night, that's something different. I'm talking about what it feels like to be desired. And that's what I felt like yesterday in a conversation with a man, 10 years, my junior in Italy. <sighs> Child. You understand? So anyway, that's it. Like, I don't know how to remedy this shit because I don't want to be that person. And I shouldn't have to be. I don't want to be the Iapo uh, you know, uh, that I was 15 years ago, you know, 20 years ago, having to check the shit out of grown men who feel like they're going to come and invade my space, invade my body and not come through for me. I shouldn't have to do that. I shouldn't have to do that. <laughs> it should, you should revel in the opportunity to have a woman completely let go and you are the cause of that. You should, should be worshipfully, worshipfully grateful for the opportunity for a woman to discover in you the ability to have five different types of orgasms. To me, it seems that that is where your badge of honor should be, not in the number of women you knock down and don't do anything for. No, it should be yo, yo, your gym room talk should be, damn, yo, like I had sex with this woman last night and she must have came 10 times. This shit was amazing. Like, I didn't even know women could do that shit. That should be your badge of honor, baby. Because any asshole can bust a nut. 
Can you galvanize the magical power that resides in sex, in sexual encounters? I saw this dude, this was about three years ago. I went to see this um, this performer. This performer, I don't even, it was some friend of mine took me. I don't even know who the dude was. But he said, I'll never forget it because every woman in there gasped. He's like, yo, <laughs> he's like, I don't know what the hell is going on in Los Angeles. He is like, but I tell you, every time I come here, some woman and I have sex, some woman is telling me how it's the best sex she's ever had. And men in L.A. don't 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 fuck right. Don't have sex right. This is what he's saying from the stage. He's like, I don't know what the hell y'all got going on here. He was like, but I'll tell you something like. I want sex to be amazing for me and for my partner. It can't be amazing if it's not. It can't be amazing for me if it's not amazing for my partner. I don't know where, where y'all came up, but for me, sex can't be amazing for me if it's not amazing for my partner. And he was like, my motto is this is a quote from this young man. He said, my motto is um, even if it's a one night stand. You fuck that woman like you're in love. And every woman, every woman in the room, there must have been 3,000 people, every woman in the room, like, gasp. <gasps> you understand? It's not rocket science that we're talking about. It is the one great, wonderful blessing bestowed on us by our mother to ensure that we never forget what ecstasy is. It's free. It's abundant. It's the thing that's supposed to ensure that we never forget what ecstasy is, what ecstasy feels like. And you motherfuckers would deny women that. You would deprive women of that because misogyny tells you to hate women or to see sex as war where you conquer somebody. <sighs> Child, so I don't know what the hell I'm going to do out here. I don't know what I'm going to do out here. Jaina came to all kinds of conclusions. I'm like, damn, Jaina came to all kinds of conclusions. One conclusion that I don't want to have to come to at my age is like, do I have to become celibate to avoid lousy fucking lays? Like that shit is unacceptable. I can't even wrap my head around it. I can't wrap my head around it. I'm not trying to do that. I'm not trying to do that. So what are my options out here, child? Child, I'm telling you, the shit is deep. I'm not being funny. I have flown home. I have flown into Atlanta. I have flown into Florida with the intention of saying, while I'm here, I'm getting laid because I can't get laid in California. I ain't lying. I, baby, look, when I tell you this, this fucking woman right here <laughs> has swag. I have never had a problem having great and wonderful, fully embodied, magical sex until I got here. And so knowing that there are men who love me, we're friends and I can call a week before going home and know that I am going to get laid and laid well before leaving Florida or leaving Atlanta. That's real. I've done it since I've been here. I'm like, fuck that. I'm going to Atlanta four times a year. If, that, if, that's, if that's the only way that I can get laid well, I'm going home four times a year. I'm going to, I'm going to Florida four times a year because it's the only way I can get laid well out here. I'm not, in, I'm not in it. I'm not into giving away my sexual power. That ain't no shit I'm into. That ain't no shit I'm into. At all, zero percent. So I've been up in this motherfucker sexless for three months. That don't sound like a lot for y'all to reach his own. For me, it's a problem. For me, it's a problem because my drive would allow me, like, baby, I could have sex three times a day easily and not tire, okay? And climax multiple times each time. So for me, three months is problematic especially since I've been single for six years. 
if I've been single for six years, I deserve to be having sex all the time. That's just what it is. That's just what it is. I deserve to be having sex. If I if I'm not having a partner, I deserve to be having sex all the fucking time when I say when I want, how I want all the time. And for that not to be happening, I got a fucking attitude. I got a problem. And I don't know what's going on. I don't know what's going on out here. I don't know if I got to teach a sex ed class to these motherfuckers out here. I don't know. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. And I'm not going to, I just don't, it's, it's bullshit, yo. Men out here, like fucking prima donnas. I don't, child. I love Southern men. You feel me? Like no games, no bullshit. It just is what it is. You know what I'm saying? This young man in Italy. Oh my God. He talked such cash shit yesterday. Grown man shit, baby. Like. Grown man shit. <laughs> understand? Like, don't fuck around and have me move to Italy out here on your ass, boy. You understand? That shit is shameful out here. So anyway, and I always warn my homegirls that come out here to visit me and shit. Like, child, don't be looking to hook up out here, child. You will be wildly disappointed. And you, I don't want that on my conscience. You understand? I do not want that on my conscience. It's the only complaint I have about this city. It is the only complaint. It's the only complaint. So anyway, I guess I'm done. I am probably going to talk to you guys more about this workshop that I teach um, called The Mysteries and Magic of the Lower Palace, which is the uterus, which is the womb in Chinese medicine. And since I am, you know, a practitioner of Chinese medicine, I should talk to you about the real, the very real implications of not only a sexless life, but a life that is sexually unfulfilled. I'll just say this short thing about it and I'll teach you the shit, the other shit later. But according to Chinese medicine, there is a, in Chinese theory, there is a book, um, it's called the triage, the triage on the diseases of nuns and concubines. And so it's, it's about 3000 years old, but it was, um, a compilation of like 1100 pages of these diseases of women, um, cysts and fibroids, tumors and the like, all kinds of vaginal and uterine issues. And um, this particular physician in the emperor's palace was noticing that these diseases were only prominent among nuns and concubines, women who were sexless, right? Now the conclusion was, was that women who did not have regular stimulation of blood, chi, and um, and fluids in the lower jowl, in the region where your, you know, your um, privates are, right, your uterus, your reproductive organs, and your vagina, that if you didn't have regular blood flow and stimulation in the lower jowl, then it would cause chi and blood stagnation over long periods of time. Chi and blood chi and blood stagnation that is not resolved becomes hardnesses, tumors, cysts, fibroids, because the chi and blood is not moving freely and the area is not stimulated. Now he called it the diseases of non nuns and concubines because they lived a sexless life, right? And so, um, however, in Chinese gynecology, in my Chinese gynecology class, um, the professor was talking to us about what he called the myth of blue balls. So he was like, you know how when a guy tells you you can't turn him on and not follow through because he'll have blue balls or whatever. And he was like, sorry, that's bullshit. This is an old, I think Dr. Zhu was maybe 68 at the time, 70, I don't know, older Chinese physician. But he's like, that's a myth. That's not true. However, it is true. A version of it is true for women. That if a woman is sexually stimulated, meaning she is aroused, and that arousal is not completed with orgasmic release over time, because you are, remember I was telling you all the way back an hour ago that when I was a little girl and I was masturbating and I would stop masturbating before I would climax because I felt like it wasn't as bad if I didn't go all the way. 
here he is 30 years later saying if you if you are denied orgasmic release once you are stimulated over time it will cause the same problem that i forget his name Lou Dejuang or whatever his name was on the diseases of nuns and concubines 3000 years ago that <clears throat> that interrupting what should be orgasmic completion and release of stimulation for women causes cysts fibroids, tumors, growths, and other types of issues in the lower jowl or what we call the lower palace, right? So imagine only a third of women in this country are saying that when they have sex, they have an orgasm, only a third. And, you know, black women are 10 times more likely to be told that they have to have partial or, or a complete hysterectomies for growth, cyst, fibroids, non-cancerous conditions, Mexican women behind them, right? Um, and we, you know, we think it's just because of what we eat or or whatever, but only a third of women are having their arousals completed with orgasmic release that is required to keep the flow, the free flow of blood, chi, and fluids in the lower jowl in the lower palace, right? Plus we hold emotional trauma, which causes chi stagnation and blood stagnation in the lower palace, right? Um, because we have a uterine vessel called the bow my, the, the, uh, the bow my, the uterine vessel, which starts at the uterus, goes through the Ming Men, goes through the heart. And then the heart controls, opens to the, opens to the throat and controls the mind. You understand? Shall. <laughs> anyway. So stop being lousy fucking lays. It's a political statement. If a woman comes and says that she had terrible sex with a partner, as far as I'm concerned, it's a crime that should be punishable and shit. <laughs> Have me tell it in the temple of evolutionary emergence. If a woman complains in the temple that she has been laid poorly by a man in the temple, it, it will be a crime that begs resolution, <laughs> that begs rectification. It's a problem. It's a problem. If you hate patriarchy, if you're a man and you hate patriarchy, if you're a man and you swear you're not a misogynist, you cannot, it's impossible to be a lousy lover if you give a damn about human beings. It is impossible to be a lousy lover if you give a damn about human beings. That's it. It's that simple. It's impossible to be a lousy lover if you give a damn about human beings. Okay? So which is it? Anyway, I'm done. Tomorrow... At 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, we will be having our regular Zoom class on the Great Cosmic Mother, Rediscovering the Religion of the Earth. Um, I swear I'm going to be so disciplined about the time tomorrow because I have so much to do. Um, I'll be sending out some information tonight on what we'll be covering. And um, with that being said, I'll say good night and uh, peace and prosperity. See you tomorrow.